All right, let's go ahead and look at this first problem here. A student is considering publishing a new magazine aimed directly at owners of Japanese automobiles. He wants to estimate the fraction of cars in the United States that are made in Japan. So he's interested in the true proportion of cars in the U.S. that are made in Japan. So that is a P he is interested in. The computer output to the right summarizes the results of a random sample of 50 autos. So sample size, N, was 50. Explain, explain carefully what it tells you. Um, looking at this right here, we have an interval, and you see in the middle it has P, Japan. This is just kind of subscript right here for the true proportion of cars in the U.S. that are made in Japan. So I would interpret this interval. I am 90% confident, right here, I am 90% confident that the true proportion of cars in the U.S. that are made in Japan is contained in the interval 32.4% to 49.86%. And it looks like we have the answer right here. So always go by the interpretation we did in class. I am blank percent confident that the blank is contained in the interval blank to blank. And they mix it up a little bit right here because they put what I do for the second part. So I just want to interpret this interval again so you can hear it and have it written down. You should be able to fill in the blanks. I am blank percent confident, 90% confident, that the true proportion of cars made in Japan, that's part two, is contained in the interval and then just say the interval as a percentage. The second part's the hardest part for people a lot of times because they can't figure out what the interval is trying to estimate. But this is just if the car was made in Japan or if it was not made in Japan, it's a categorical question. This will be important later on when we start looking at data with quantitative values in it. But this is a categorical question, so it is proportions and this should be the right answer. Let's go ahead and give it a check. Yay, one down. Let's go on to the next question here. Of 550 broiler chickens purchased from various kinds of food stores in different regions of a country and tested for types of bacteria that cause foodborne illness, illnesses, 21% were infected with a particular bacterium. Such happy questions. So they are interested, when you look at this, they are going out, they sampled 550 broiler chickens, and they tested it yes or no to see if it has a certain bacteria. They, it was a yes or no, does it have this bacteria? Always relate it back to what did they test? They are trying to test if it has a bacteria. That's a categorical question, yes or no. So we're trying to estimate the true proportion of chickens that have bacteria, um, broiler chickens specifically. We want to construct a 99% confidence interval. So with this in mind right here. Okay, so we have the calculator up. We want to construct a 99% confidence interval. Now the 99% comp store, we're going to need to go to the David M. Lane applet or statdistributions.com. If you see this has a 95%, we need to change it to 99. This is statdistributions.com. It's a great site. And I have clicked on here two sided to means and I have selected the normal distribution. So that's why it says normal up here. Make sure you're using the normal. You can compute a 99% comp store. It has a Z score of 2.576. What this means is this is my confidence level. This is my Z for a certain confidence level, 2.576, and I will use that for the Z. We have to have P hat. The problem stated that 21% of the chickens in the sample had this problem, so that is my P hat. Next, we have to have the sample size, which is N, which is 550. So from here, it's not too bad because we're gonna solve the inner part of this first. We're gonna take 21% times 79% because that's P times Q as you see up here and we solve that I always hit an RFG step then we're going to divide by the sample size of 550 P times Q over N this is excuse me P hat times Q hat over N and then we go second square root second answer so that's going to put my answer from before this is now my standardizing factor everything inside of this square root including the square root is solved now I'm going to times it by 2.57 Five, six. And I believe, there we go. I believe that was the number that I was showing, 2.5756. And it just rounds it up from right there. There's, yeah, <laughs> I've done these problems too much. It's 2.5756 with the extra decimal, um, the extra decimal place. And if you notice, that was my Z that I solved for. This is now my margin of error. So all I have to do is take my center, which is P hat, plus that margin of error. So we'll go center plus answer and then 0.21 minus 
uh, 0.04473. And there's my answers. I have my upper and lower bound. I am 99% confident that the true proportion of chickens that have this bacteria in it is contained in the interval 16.52% to 25.47%. 16.52, 25.47. 16.52, 25.47. So 16.25. I think it was 25.47. Ah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah, I got them kept them in my head. That's good. So there we go. We have the answer. Um, this is just constructing an interval with summary statistics. You can also do it on the calculator. I'll look more at that at later problems, but nothing's wrong with... Uh, we could look at it real quick. Let's bring up the calculator right here and put it in, and we're going to see something interesting, I think, when we go to stat test down to number A, which stands for one sample with proportions, the Z distribution, making an interval. When we do this right here, you'll notice, I've already kind of went through it once, if we put in 21% and we times that by 550, I'm hitting wrong buttons, and times that by 550, this gives us the sample number of successes, which is a condition we also need to check, the NP hat, NQ hat condition for this. And it reports that there were 115.5 sample successes, which can't be, which can't happen here because this is discrete data. So with discrete data, you have to have a discrete number of successes. And we can go ahead and hit calculate right here, and we're going to see basically an identical interval. Hopefully, this thing has enough leeway in it to accept this answer. It probably does, but and on the test, I think we would accept this too. Um, it's just weird to say 21% when you can't get 21% of 550. Um, qualms with my Pearson on these questions. Okay, what does the confidence interval say about the chickens sold in the country? We are 99% confident that the interval captures the true proportion of all broiled chickens sold in the country that are infected with the bacteria. Uh, that is... We are 99% confident that the interval captures the true proportion of all broiler chickens sold in the country that are infected with the bacteria. There is a 99% chance that the true proportion of broiler chickens infected with the bacterium is in this interval. We're, this is an interesting one right here, because it's going to be A. And the reason being is there, C is a wording issue. It's not that there's a chance that the true proportion is in there. We're confident in the interval process. The interval is what we have confidence in. The true proportion exists. So we're confident when you make intervals through the process of making more and more intervals, the 99% confidence will have the true value in it 99% of the time, or 99% of 99% confidence will have the true value in it 99% of the time. <laughs> so redundant. But what it means, it's the law of large numbers like we've talked about. The more intervals you make, the more that proportion of time that it contains the true amount will equal to the confidence level. So it's not like we have confidence in this one interval and it's not like the true proportion will fall inside of it. Um, it's that we are confident in the process of making intervals and it gets into specific wording. And it's, it's just the idea of that. If you make a whole bunch of intervals, your confidence in the whole process of being intervals is related to that confidence level. It's not that one interval. Is the government spokesperson's criticism valid? What was their criticism? So they are just kind of mad about what's going on. Um, so the other criticism claimed that the sample size was too small relative to the billions. No, the sample size isn't too small. Um, no, I think it's going to be this one right here. No, as long as the necessary assumptions and conditions are met, the results can be generalized. Yeah, as long as we randomly selected the chickens, there are less than 10% of all chickens, and we had enough to meet the success failure condition, which 21% of 550 would be, that'd be close to like 110. So we're good. Here we are to question three. A consumer advocacy group publishes a study of labeling of seafood study of labeling of seafood sold in three U.S. states. The group purchases 238 pieces of seafood from various kinds of food stores and restaurants in three states, and genetically compared the pieces to standard gene fragments that can identify the specimens. That's hardcore. 
The study found that 12 out of the 24 red snappers, which is 50%, packages tested with a different kind of fish. Assume that the study used a sample, a simple random sample. Good, so it was, it was random. Um, here we are. Are the conditions met? So if they're building an interval or something, which sounds like they are for this, then we have enough. We have at least 10 successes and at least 10 failures. They randomly took it, and it sounds like it's less than 10%. So we are good, it looks like. What is, so D says there's 20 successes and failures. So that's not right. We only need 10 successes and failures. This one is ripe for a confidence interval. And just remember, 12 out of 24 is our sample proportion. So when we build this confidence interval right here, all we are using is our equations. And this one's really fun and easy to do because the uh, sample proportion was 50%. Remember, 50% is P hat. And is it, I always forget to look at the percentages on these intervals. 95. Oh, yes. 95 is so great because many of you already know right now 1.96, which is very close to our 2. So you have to find the Z-score. You have to know it. Um, 1.96 is a classic confidence interval, and that goes right here for the Z. You'll notice my Z was bigger last time because it was a 99% confidence interval. Bigger the confidence interval, excuse me, higher the confidence, bigger the Z. So that will always apply. So let's plug in our numbers right here. The sample proportion, and I'm solving this inner part first, was 50%, and my calculator is not on, apparently. It turned off. Who knew? And I'm going to times that by 50%. Then I'm going to divide that by the sample size of 24, or negative 4, negative 2, you know, whatever works. So let's do that again. <laughs> I must have hit a wrong key. There we go. And then hit Enter. And then I'm going to divide this by, I wish this was voice activated, 24. There we are. And this gives me this inner part, but I still need to square root it. I have forgotten many a times to square root this. And your answer will be way too small then, because when you square root fractions, they get bigger. So there is my standard deviation. It was such a small sample size that you say to me, how confident can you be? Um, well, it's, excuse me, it's a standard error. It's going to be a really wide interval. That's because we have such a small sample size. And you can see right here when I times it by basically 2, wow, I love it. That's 20%. Because what's my center? 50%. So what's my confidence roll? 30 to 70%. Awesome. I love this question. Best question ever. So here we go back to the interval. Let's create it. Three decimal places. I think I'm good on this because there were a lot of zeros past that. Let's hit enter. Nice work. Yes. So that was 50% plus or minus 20%. Explain what the confidence roll means from part B. It says about red snapper. Uh, select the answers below. There, one is 95% confident that between blank blank of, it sounds like it's going to be B or D, C because I am 95% confident that the true proportion of red snappers that are mislabeled is contained in the interval blank to blank. And so it's not the ones that are purchased for the study. It is the ones for like all, because this talks about all the things, because that we're not just talking about the ones for the study. We know 50% of the red snappers purchased for the study were mislabeled. So we want to know for all red snappers. That's very important right there. Just to go one step further on that question, I could have again done it under stat, and this is, I'm building a confidence roll for a proportion. Uh, so we go here again. Simply enter in R, and can I hit enter on this? Does it like that? It does. So, and I mess up, of course, because I'm not thinking. Um, we enter in our successes. That is our number of successes, our sample size, and then our confidence level. And nice and neat, there's my interval, even calculated further to the decimals, 30 to 70%. And you could find the center of that by averaging those two. That's kind of a key right there. If you notice the center of 50%, is those two numbers averaged together. So kind of good tricks. I could also get the margin of error by taking the upper minus the middle or the lower minus the middle. It's just the margin of error is how far these are apart. Like how far is the top part from the middle part? That's the margin of error because the margin of error is the plus or minus. Hey, it's a margin of error question. <laughs> a poll taken this year asked 10,000, 1,021 adults whether they were fans of a particular sport. 59% said they were. And last year, 54% of a similar size sample had reported being fans of the sport. Complete parts A through E. Find the margin of error for the poll taken this year if one wants 
95% confidence in estimating. So they want a 95, they want the margin of error for a 95% confidence roll. As we just saw, and it's for this year, the formula is going to have a Z of 1.96, because this is the 95% confidence roll Z. And we need to use this right here. So I think the sample size was 1,021, uh, and the uh, percent was 59. So we just need to solve. So we take 59% times 41%. That's P hat times Q hat. Then we go over N. Uh, that two does not seem to work. I don't know why. There we go. And then we square root. And now we have to, I cannot hit the buttons today, everybody. Second, square root, second, answer. Okay, that has solved the inner part of this. Now we need to times it by the Z, because everything here is the margin of error. And that is the margin of error, 0 0.3016. And it wants it in a decimal, 0, 0.0, and that should be it, I think. Let's double check here. Find the margin of error of the poll taken this year, and let's look at the calculator. That looks to be it. Great job. Explain what the margin of error means. So this brings in some interesting interpretation. Let's see here. In 95% of samples of adults, the portions who were fans of the sports will be within plus or minus blank margin. No, that doesn't sound right. One is 95% confident the sample proportion, not the sample proportion. We all know about the true proportion. So it's down to A and B. There is a 95% chance that the true proportion of adults, that, it's talking about chance again. One is 95% confident plus or minus the margin of error. One is 95% plus or minus margin of error confident that the true proportion of adults who are fans of sports is equal to this sample proportion. Now that doesn't sound right. So A sounds a little wrong. There is a 95% chance that the true proportion of adults who are fans of the sport is within plus or minus margin of error of this sample proportion. That sounds halfway decent. C, one is 95% confident that this sample proportion is within, no. So, in 95% of samples of proportions, if one wanted to be 80% confident instead of 95% confident, would the margin of error be larger or smaller? So, as we see, the Z is going to get smaller for this. So, when we go down to 80% confidence, our Z statistic would be smaller. And if you look at that, that would make the margin of error smaller since Z is smaller. So let's take a look here. If we're 80% confident, so to be less confident, the interval needs to contain the true proportion less often, so the margin of error would be smaller. Decent question right there. You should know what happens when the confidence all change and what happens to the parts of the interval. Find the margin of error for the poll taken this year if one wants to be 80% confident. Ay, 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 so much work. Um, we just saw a second ago it was 1.282, so that's my Z. Um, frankly, what I can do, you can do the math too, but I'm just taking all that inner math work I just did, and, well, I had the number right there. That was the inside p hat times q hat over n square root. So now just take that number you just had and times it by 1.282. And that's the margin of error, 0 0.197. There we go. Typo right there. Sorry about that. In general, if all other aspects of the situation remain the same, will smaller margin of errors produce greater or less confidence in the interval? So if all other aspects of the situation remain the same, will smaller or mar margin of errors produce, and this is the thing, it's saying we're not changing the Z, or excuse me. In general, 
will smaller margin of errors. And I kind of have problems with this because so if we have smaller margin of errors, it's going to produce less confidence. Um, but if it's saying the Z doesn't change, then that's an issue because if the Z doesn't change, then you have the same level of confidence. So there's other ways to change the margin of error of the interval. If you increase the sample size, the interval gets tighter. And so tighter interval means smaller margin of error. So, but if you're saying if the margin of error gets smaller, what do you think happened to your confidence level? You probably are less confident because think about it. It's a smaller interval. You're less confident that the true proportion is in there, but it, would, it should hopefully say that the Z has changed and that's what changes the confidence level. Insurance company checks police records on 563 accidents selected at random. Hey, that's good. And notes that teenagers were at the wheel in 91 of them. Construct a 95% confidence roll. So we've done a lot of these right now. I'm going to kind of breeze through this one. Uh, it's just going over here, and I could do it by hand. It's 1.96 for the Z. It's the same formula we've been using. Uh, so 91, and I can hit enter right. Yes, good. 563. And that's got it right there. So this is 13.1 and 19.2. Kind of breeze through that one. I am 95% confident that the true proportion of, let's see here, that the true percentage of adults, accidents involving teenagers, nope, needs to mention the interval. Um, this sounds good to me here because I am 95% confident that the true proportion of accidents that had a teenager at the wheel is contained in the interval blank to blank. So this is one that's also on the homework. We are 95% confident that a random sample size of 563 will produce a confidence roll that contains the true proportion. So 95% of random samples. So we should see it. It's a confidence in the process of making these intervals. So the politician is claiming one in every five, and we could kind of test this value. We've talked about how confidence rolls and tests overlap. If we tested one in every five, we'd be testing the null that the true proportion is equal to 20%. Is 20% a valid idea? No, we would reject 20%. This confidence interval contradicts um, because it is outside. So the politician cannot be said to be right, and we'll just take a look at it. Because remember, this politician is saying, ah, I think 20% of teenagers are at the wheel when this accident occurs or 20% of accidents involve teenage drivers. And you'd say, no, 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 we have evidence that it's not 20%. We have evidence it's less than 20%, which is an alternative to say we have evidence it's less than 20%. So this would be a hypothesis about the true proportion, and we could use the, the confidence rule right here to run the test. Kind of a kind of a neat little thing right there. Created 90% confidence rule. Oh, you guys are going to be so good at this. So this is, once again, randomly selected data. Let's go here and do it quick in the calculator. Remember, you just need to identify P times Q over N square root. 21 right here, 132, and 90%. 90%, let's look up the David M. Lane picture for that. Because all you need to do is plug and chug these numbers in. 90% is 1.645. And you would simply take all these numbers. People get a little bit confused on this one maybe because... It doesn't give you p hat. You need to solve p hat by doing x over n, which is the number of trials over the number of successes, which in this problem, p hat would be 21 over 132. And this gives me my interval. And it is 10.6 to 21.1. And if they want to cut the margin and error, margin of error in half. So this turns into an algebra problem now. Fun times. So we have a margin of error right now, and let's find it over here. A margin of error of, let's take 0.21146 minus 0.1. I am finding the margin of error. The margin of errors mean merely just how much the plus or minus is. So that is the center of the interval, and I'd have to add 5.237% to get to the top part. So now I can divide this in half, and if there's a tighter margin of error, this means a higher sample size. So now, what I have to do, is I'm going to have to solve an equation. So much fun. 
the margin of error is still going to be everything the same except for n. So when we solve this right here, we know what z is, but we want to solve for n. So let's see right here. Our p hat is 0 0.15909. That's what x over n is. So let's solve p hat. 5909 times q hat, which is going to be 0. Point, I'm going to do this in my head real quick. 841. I'm thinking for a moment. 191. <laughs> and I stand corrected because this is a 0. If you just add that up right there, everything starts stacking on top, and that should be correct. So that's p hat times q hat. Now we can't do the over n. Uh, so this in mind right here, we now have to square everything. So we're just solving this, everything with z over here. So everything with z over here, we're just solving. So we want this to equal up to 0 0.26185. That's what we know everything has to equal up to. So now we are going to square all of this. Um, but first, let's divide the other side by the z. I'm just going to take 0 0.02618. I swear I hit that one. It's just trolling me today. 185. And I'm going to divide by my z. This was a what percent confidence roll again? It was a 90%. So with a 90% confidence roll right here, um, 1.28, oops, 1 point, I was thinking about the previous one. This is my 90% confidence roll Z. And there's that. And then I'm going to take my answer and I'm going to square it. And now that has brought out everything from the underneath the square root. So all I have over here is equals this, and I have p hat times q hat, which is going to be this right here over n. So then we times both sides by n, and we're left with n on this side, and we just need to divide our numbers. This is all just fun algebra stuff. Um, probably need to write it out a little bit more by hand than the way I'm doing it because now I'm merely just dividing up my answers. And since there's so many decimals, and I wish my calculator had the up button to press things, carry them all out, and you'll probably be quicker. One, two, three, that's scientific notation right there. So make sure to enter in the right amount of zeros. And you never know how many decimals you need with these types of problems. So it's always good to buffer yourself and be safe. Okay, 528. That was fun. I picked the best problems for this. 528. There we go. What concerns do you have about this sample? Ay, ay, ay. Since deer ticks are parasites and can easily be spread from one deer to another, the ticks may not be distributed evenly through the deer population. Since female deer and young deer are usually not hunted, the sample may not be representative of all deer. Ooh, that's a good one. Since female and young deers are usually not hunted, the sample may not be representative of all deers. Also, since deer ticks are parasites and can easily be spread from one deer to another, the ticks may not be distributed evenly throughout the deer population. It didn't say anything about randomness. So, yeah, I'm, I'm interested with, I'm interested with this one right here. This sounds about right to me. Yeah. I thought the, the females not being hunted was even more of a valid concern. It's because they didn't say anything about randomness there. A TV newscaster reports the results of a poll of voters and then says the margin of error is plus or minus 3%. Explain carefully what this means. Oh, easy one, finally. It means that 3% of the polls are invalid. No, the sample proportion is within 3% of our estimate. Nope, because we're making talks about the true proportion here is within, yeah. The proportion of the population who voted for one candidate is 3%. Uh, no, 
This is right right here. Wow, they had to put it last. Maybe we say nope to all those. And read over their answers. Oh, wow. Now we're on to some testing stuff. So let's see here. So I think this one's similar. Let's move things about a little bit here. So this one right here is going to be um, an organization monitors many aspects of elementary and secondary education nationwide. Their 1995 numbers are often used as baseline to assess changes. In 1995, 18% of students had not been absent. And this is a problem you guys have on your homework. So you probably already have seen how to do it and looked through it, hopefully. So the null is always a statement of equals. So it would be P equal to 18%. That's a good thing to know, to write P equals 18% on the test. And it says they would note any change. This is important right here. The school officials would note any change. That's so important. Since they would note any change, we're going to see if it's different. That is so important. The conditions, random, 10%, success, failure. That's how we say them. Random, 10%, success, failure. Did they randomly select the students? Yes. Is it less than 10% of all students? Yes. And is there at least 10 successes and at least 10 failures according to the null? So I'm going to specifically show how to check this one here and probably not check it again. The null is about 18%. I want to make that clear. P naught, which is a little P with a zero next to it, or in a subscript. Let's take a look at it. P naught for this problem is the hypothesized null proportion. And we have our sample proportion again, our sample size, and our standardized test statistic. But with this in mind right here, this condition is P naught, N P naught, and Q naught. And so when we check it right here, well, the smaller one is 18%, and then we would multiply that by the sample size. So this is n p naught by the p naught n, and they both have to add up to n. And so if we pass on one, we pass. Excuse me. If we pass on the smaller, we pass on the bigger one, and yeah. So we are good. Eighty-two percent of that number will be much bigger than ten. So we pass on all of them. The success failure condition, which is n p naught and q naught this time, and we are good. We usually in class just wrap these two up into a nice bundle and just call it randomization, 10% success failure. So that's what we have there. Perform the test and find the p-value. Okay, so we have to find out how far it is away to start. Our new figure is 1% away. Just, just look at that. The new figure is 1% away. And then what do you want to do to that 1% it is away? That's p-hat was 17%, this is 18%. Just how far was it away? And then standardize it. Yeah, let's do it. So... We have the sample size there, good. I knew I typed that in for a reason. 18% times, and make sure you're using P naught right now. This is the null proportion. So there's P naught times Q naught, and I hit the wrong button. And so let's do second answer, because I hit the wrong button. Divided by, and we need N, which is eight, six, Five zero, and then we take second answer, second square root in the reverse order, and there is our standardizing factor, which we're going to take one percent, and we were actually below, so let's be particular here and put negative one percent because seventeen percent minus eighteen percent is negative one percent, and we are going to divide that by. And this gives us our z-score, which is going to be about 2.5-ish, negative 2.5-ish. So specifically, we have the z-score right here. Now, what do we have to do with the z-score of negative 2.42? We have to plot it. We have to go over here and plot our z-score. Negative 2.42. And most importantly, we have to pick the right test, a two-tailed test. If you notice, we have a reflection over here, and our p-value is shown. There we are. That is the test. We've done everything. Um, the p-value, I think, was 0 0.016. And that is our p-value. State your conclusion at a 0.05 alpha. When the p is low, we will reject the null. So we can reject, because it's below 0.05, alpha is the point at which we reject. Anytime we reject, there is evidence for the alternative. Nice and easy like that. 
we could have done this problem right here in the calculator. Um, let's take a look at it. Go to stat. And this is a one prop Z test because we have one sample. We're using proportions, Z distribution doing a test. And the proportion we were testing, if you notice, that's your notation right there. Let's put in a zero before that. Be nice and neat. 18% is the null proportion. And this is where people get confused because we have to put an X, which is just going to be the sample proportions times the sample size. And this is just giving me X right here as I mistype everything. Hopefully this turns out to be a whole number. Um, if it doesn't, I have to round it, and that's always good fun. So I'm going to round that up and just round it to its closest number. My sample size was 8650, and if you take x over n, you will get very close to p hat again. And if you notice, we have the alternative right here that the true proportion is not equal to the null proportion, and I described the null proportion as 18, once again saying p not equal to uh, p naught. We can draw it out here, and we're going to see the exact same picture we saw in the David M. Lane applet, and hopefully see a p-value very close to 0 0.016, and that's what we get. That's great. It turned out a tiny bit different because I had to round, but still very close, and it would probably still give you all the right answers, and it should give you the right answers on the test too. I hate it when we have to round because then it's slightly different. So let's take a look at this one right here. A philanthropic organization sent out mailings to 100,000 people. This one's also on the homework, so we'll kind of go through it a little bit quickly. They want to see, let's see what they want to see here. It's always important to identify the alternative. Um, they hope to get a higher rate. They hope the true proportion of people who respond to their mailers will increase. So the null has the equal sign, and the alternative is whatever way the question states. Let's continue on here. And this, once again, says the true proportion of people who respond to the mailer is equal to 5%, which is what we saw in the past. And the alternative states that we want to see the true proportion of people who respond to the mailer is greater than. Hopefully they did this randomly. Let's see here. Does it say random anywhere on here? Random sample, it does. Randomly sent. Always check that. This is, uh, it looks like they maybe had a really big mailing list. Let's hope so. I will assume they had a big mailing list. Uh, they probably didn't send it to like the same people like let's see here. independence means you can't have one observation influence the next and it's basically the idea of randomness so I usually couple those together and success failure well we can see in well 5% of 100,000 is 5,000 so that's that passes the success failure and we need to check n p naught and that's p naught right here so we're good Going on further, continue on with the question. Do you think this donation rate would rise? So now we have to find the p-value in it. So it doesn't even say, like, run the test, find the z-scores. So maybe this is a different one. Uh, let's put it into the calculator here real quick. And let's do a one prop z test. So what we need is the null proportion, which was 5%. And then we need the observed number of successes. Then we need the sample size, and truthfully, this is such a big sample that I think it will rise. And they wanted to see if the true proportion is greater than. This is the true proportion is greater than the null proportion. And let's draw it out right here. So you can get this with the David M. Lane applet, and wow, that's a big p-value. Oh, gosh. That's a excuse, not a big p-value, but it's a big z-score. That's a small p-value. So this p-value is very low. And so the p-value is low enough to conclude um, that the rate would be above, point of, above 5%. That's a, that's a very, very small p-value. And once again, if you want to do this question by hand, I highly suggest doing those by hand because all you have to do is plug in your sample proportion right here found by dividing 5,200, that number by 100,000. That'll get you p hat which will be like 5.2 something and then this right here will be p naught which is 0 0.05 and then 0 0.05 0.95 over 100,000 square root that'll get you your z plot your z since it's a greater than test so we'd plot our z which was like 3.4 i'm just kind of estimating and then you would plot the right tail which you really can't even see right now so the p value is very close to zero as i said that's a very very small p value because it's a very very big z score Okay, okay. So
So the null hypothesis always has the equal sign, and we're doing proportions, so it has to have p. So later on chapters, you'll have to know it would be p right there. But since it's a proportion, we're interested um, in the proportion of people who get accepted. Um, so this company is training people. They had 200 out of their 250 get accepted. Um, they want to see if there is improvement. So they want to see if the true proportion of people who get accepted is greater than this 73%. So that's what the company wants to claim. They want to show that the true proportion of people who get accepted is greater than 73%. And 80% of their applicants got accepted. This is P hat. That's from the sample. We, we know the sample. We want to see if there's evidence that the true proportion is greater than 73%. And the sample is kind of our best view into that. Once again, I always want people to think that what you're doing right here in this question is taking the difference of 80% and 73%, which is 7%, and then you're standardizing that. So, you know, we can get the z-score for this very quickly. I don't even care what the question says. Um, if we take the null proportion was 73% times 27%, I'm just solving this bottom out here, and then they sent it out to 250 applicants, and then we square root it, So now we just take 0 0.07, which was 80% minus 73%, divided by second answer, and that's our z-score. And the z-score there is very large. Um, frankly, I'm going to take my, favorite, my fun guesses at this. So let's see what the question asks here. What's the next part of it? Is it find the z? Is the conditions met? Uh, I guess that's less than 10% of all their applicants. Um, is the randomization condition met? Here's a, assume these trainees were representatives of the population of applicants. So they're representatives. That sounds like it was random. It sounds like that's good. And then 73% of this is greater than 10 and also 27% of that is greater than 10. As long as it's more than 100 sample and more than 10%. So some quick math right here. I'm just solving it in my head. That's 73% because we have to do P naught times N and Q naught times N, but they both are greater than 10. I like that it says it's representative of their applicants. So that seems to me like it was random, like they did a good job. What is the P value? So they're jumping way ahead. Um, you know, we can, I'm going to take a stab at it. I always love guessing at P values. Um, how many decimals? Four decimals. Okay, this is a guess, everybody. Don't, don't hold it against me if it's a bad guess. I'm using all my brain power. Let's see. Don't hold it against me if it's a bad guess. I'm using all my brain power. Okay. Got it. That is the right p-value. And how did I get that? Well, I knew a 99% confidence roll. If you're wondering how in the world did I get that, I knew a 99% confidence roll. And 99% confidence roll is going to be 2 point, And we actually did this earlier, 5756. Five, and I knew that this area, since this is a 99% confidence roll, I took half the area, which would be 0 0.005. And I added on a little bit extra area by bringing it in a little bit. So I think that's what it was right there. And this one seems to not give enough. You could go to the David M. Lane applet to get more decimals. So that is what we got going on. You could also do it in the calculator under stat tests. So stat tests would also solve for you. Would you recommend this company uh, based on, yeah, the, the p-value provides strong evidence that they're successful. That is, that is great. Okay, so on this problem right here, we have this one in the homework and the conditions would be random, 10%, success failure, and we can check through those. We've done them quite a few times already, so I'm kind of going quicker on that one. The null would be that young teen mothers have the same birth rates as everyone else. The alternative would be, based on the question, is it the same? So we're trying to see, is it the same or is there evidence it is different? That's the key word. Always look at the question for what the alternative is. The question will direct you. If it really gives no preference, like it's not saying like, is there evidence that they're having more twins? It says, is it the same? 
So the alternative is what we want to find evidence of, so we're seeing if there's a difference. I'm going to do this one purely in the calculator right here. So this one right here can be done once again under your, let's go to turn it on, go to stat, and we want to go to one prop Z test. And we need to enter in the null proportion. And then we need to enter in the sample size right here. How many did they talk to? 522. Oops, sample size goes one more down. 522, and there was 15. And they want to see if it's different, so I need to change my alternative. Once again, this states the true proportion of twins is not equal to the null proportion. And let's go ahead and draw it. So p is looking big. So this is not going to be evidence right here. And the z-score is right here. If you notice, it's negative. So we actually landed here, and we're flipping it over to here. Negative 1.1071. And please try plugging this into your uh, calculator. You know, it depends on how good you feel about these. Um, but it's, it's mainly just practice when it comes to these. 1 and 07 is going to round, I believe. There we go. And the p-value, if you think about it, outside of negative 1 and positive 1, because this is a two-sided, is 32%. So this is probably about 24%. 26.83. So 26.83. 0.268. And can we reject the null? Well, we definitely fail to reject the null. Well, that's easy. There's only one thing. If we fail to reject the null, there is no evidence. Well, that was a nice one. A magazine is considering the launch of an online edition. The magazine plans to go ahead if it is convinced that more than 20%. So they're going to see if there's evidence that more than 20%. So that's the alternative. The magazine contacted a random sample of 400 subscribers and 104 of these surveyed expressed interest. What should the company do? Uh, so it sounds like they randomly selected them and we, uh, less than 10% of the population, and we passed the success failure, which would be tested by P naught times N, which is 80. 20% of 400 is 80, and then Q naught times N would be 320. So here we go on. There's our null alternative. So they want to see if there's evidence of more than 20%. Nice. I love these questions. Walks you right through. Now we have to determine the Z statistic. So in our sample, we found, oh, look at that, that's so nice. I think we found 26%. 104 divided by 400. I think it's going to be 26%. Yeah, we found 26%. So think about how far away 26% is from 20. P hat is 26%. P naught is 20%. So that's 6% away. All we do now to that 6% is standardize it. So let's go ahead and standardize it. We take P naught. This is my standardizing factor times Q naught. And I'm using the same formula for every question right here. The one I'll show it again in a second. So this is my P naught times Q naught over N square root. It's really good to just have memorized because then you can just punch it in. And that's my standardizing factor. And I was 6% away. The Z score is 3. And frankly, we can we know the rest of this because I'm going to take. 0.06 right here and divide by 0 0.02 because the top part of my equation let's look at the equation again the top part of my equation was my 26% I observed minus my 20% that I thought to be true hypothesized to be true and I standardized it by this standardizing standard, standard error which was 0 0.02 so 6% divided by 2% is 3 and that's what I got right here when I solved. And as per usual, I could put it on the Dame of Dame Lane applet, but I love it when we solve this in our brains. It's so great. Because think about it. If we have 3 right here as our z-score, is it going to ask me the p-value? Now, I think I know the p-value a little bit more exactly. Four decimals. 0, 0.00. 0 and you guys are going to say 1.5 here. But it's actually going to be... Oh, my. I think 1.5 will work. Gonna like that? No, it doesn't like it. I think it's gonna be, and we might have to go over to David M. Lane, because 99.7% confidence roll is actually 99.73. And my brain is slowing down today ever so slowly. I think I see what it is. 
Oh, <laughs> I put in one too many things. Oh, is it really that specific? It's going to want this. Oh, let's visit Mr. David M. Lane for us today. So David M. Lane. So here we are. How specific is it going to want? It's more fun to do these things in your head, you know? So above three. Oh, I hit the wrong button. Yep, there's the answer. Ah, oh, that's so specific. I'm so glad I got that last one. But um yeah. Look at that. That's I was off by the littlest amount. And I got that first answer by the empirical rule because of sixty eight, ninety five, ninety nine point seven. Um, what is your conclusion? Uh, that's a small p-value. I don't even care what alpha is. Any reasonable alpha would have us reject. The p-value is low. We reject the null, and we're good. So there is evidence that they should do it. Um, the survey results would be unusually high. Uh, so it looks like so they should launch it. There we go. Because 20% does not seem believable if we observe that in our sample. So we would reject 20% and say there's evidence that more than 20%. A company is criticized because only 19 of its 47 board of branch of executive members are women. The company explains that although this proportion is lower than it might wish, it's not surprising given that only 43% of its all of its employees are women. The company has more than 500 executives worldwide. Test an appropriate hypothesis and state the conclusion. Okay, so they give us the 500 to say that this is less than 10% of the sample. So it's less than 10% of the population, excuse me. So we would assume that if this is the makeup of their company, maybe they're just not hiring enough women, so who knows. But if that's the makeup of their company, then, you know, well, we would assume the true proportion of the makeup of their executives should be equal to that. So it is claimed, the company explains its proportion is lower than it might wish. It's not surprising. So test an appropriate hypothesis. So they are being criticized. So they're, they're probably trying to see if there's evidence that the true proportion is less than that, which is a little more clear. It would say, like, they're trying to investigate if they don't hire enough women to be executives. That's what it sounds like to me, and that is the answer. So what do we do here? Well, this is the null proportion. This is P0, and now we need to get P hat. And I'm going to solve this one via the calculator. I like doing this sometimes. We want to do a one prop Z test. And in here we type in our P0 which is 0 0.43 and then our sample size of 19 and then our I keep saying sample size for that our number of successes which is 19 and our sample size and then our appropriate alternative and this is just solving all the math and it's making the nice perfect drawing for us so this right here wow okay so we landed really close so our p hat if you notice Thinking about this distribution right here, P0 is at the center, P hat is where we land, and we're going to shade to the left. Remember, if it's a less than alternative, you shade to the left. If it's a greater than alternative, you shade to the right. If it's a does not equals alternative, you reflect it over to the other side, so it's got, you know, this would be a very large does not equals. It would be simply double this, the p value. So this one right here, um, let me click in here, negative 0. Point Three five, I think it was. Die click. Yep. And this one right here is zero point three six. Is that right? That was right. So because the p value is high, we fail to reject the null. Well, that's easy. And there's no evidence. Since the p value is high, we fail to reject the null. There's no evidence. Okay, a nonprofit company concerned with the dropout rate at schools is designing a tutoring program aimed at students, yada, yada, yada. They want to figure out the true proportion of students who drop out. The dropout rate was 11.6%. One school district who adopts this uh, dropout rate has always been very close to the national average. Um, is there evidence that the tutoring program has been effective? So they want to lower the dropout rate. They want to show that the true proportion of students who drop out is lower than what we've seen. So remember, Always identify P0. P0 is what we believe to be true, and this would be true if the company is not changing anything. If the company has no effect, that would stay true. Compute the test statistic. So once again, we're in the realm of we have to identify this is this is X, it's the number of successes, this is N, number of trials, X over N gets us P hat, which is sample number of successes in the sample. 
or sample proportion of successes in the sample. Uh, this is P naught right here. And once you've identified X, N, P naught, P hat, simply take everything, and I can't state this more than enough, go over here and solve. Because once you have P, P hat minus P naught, that's the difference, and then standardize that difference. So identify and make sure you mark. Once again, this is P naught right here. This is X. This is N. X over N is P hat. So identify in your problem the notation. And I'll do this one a little bit quickly again because I feel like we've hit upon a lot of similar questions. But as you can see, if you know how to do the questions, they're not that bad. I wanted to speed up near the end here. Um, so we're testing 11.6%. We observed 170 successes out of 1,756, and we're testing to see if it has gone down, which we have right there, and we can hit calculate this time. Let's hit calculate instead of draw, because we'll actually see p hat right here. p hat is 9.6%. The p value is very small, and the z statistic is very large. So negative 2.511. And the p-value, it's very close to, so this has to be close to, let's see here, 0 0.06. And is there a zero after that? There is. And I had a p-value like that earlier. I think I could have guessed that because last time I had positive and a greater than test. If you notice, if you do a greater than test and you get a positive value of this, it's the same. It's just reflecting. So is it effective? Well, the p-value is very small, so this shows evidence for the alternative that it's going down. Um, so the school's dropout rate would be unusual, would be unusual, would be highly unusual if the national dropout rate was still this. Um, so we think it has been effective because this would be weird to see in this sample if 11.6% is still true. So we have evidence it's working uh, on the home stretch here. An airline's public relations department says that the airline rarely loses passengers' luggage. It further claims that on those equations, when the luggage is lost, 86% is recovered and delivered to its owner within 24 hours. A consumer group who surveyed a large number of air travelers found that only three of 154 people who lost their luggage on that airline were united with their missing items by the next day. So let's see here. This seems odd. I haven't read this one yet. I think I, I looked over and I was like, oh, that sounds decent. And it tells me a little summary of the problems when I look at them. So a consumer group who surveyed a large number of air, air travelers found that only three of 154 people who lost their luggage on that airline were united with the missing items by the next day. Um, so it's a large airline. And yes, this should be met because we have 86% of this. 86% is, is the P naught, and that's that's more than uh, 10. And then 14% of that is also more than 10. So since we meet all the conditions, uh, we want to see, let's see here, does this cast doubt? So with this in mind right here, I really wish it gave preference. It looks like they're trying to say that they're not meeting this. Um, I don't see any preference is the issue. So I'm inclined to say that does not equals. And on the test, we'd be more specific. But the way they have this set up, they're trying to say, I think that's less than. Yeah. On the test, it should say, do they have evidence that it is less than or that uh, they're doing worse than this? Worse, you know, less than, all those things give direction. Oh my gosh. This, this Z score here is ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> only three out of 154? Did they write this question as a joke? Because 3% or 3 out of 154 is ridiculous. This is, you know, 2%. And 2%'s distance from 86 is ridiculous. This Z score for this is going to be astronomically negative, And the p value is going to be zero. I mean, this, this Z score is, is huge. Um, so let's, let's go ahead and solve here. P naught. I looked at this problem and I was like, I can just tell you by my brain that it's it's significant. P naught times Q naught over N. 
and then second it's like I, I don't need statistics for this one this one's a no-brainer so that is my standardizing factor that's the standard deviation of p hat right here and with this in mind right here let's take the distance <laughs> uh so let's see uh we need to take p p hat observed minus uh p naught this is i have never used statistics for something this obvious it's like two percent of people get their luggage back is their claim of 84 percent accurate and so now we're dividing it by the standardizing factor z-score is negative 30.06 I don't even know why to ask for two decimals I, I should have just been able to write in here big <laughs> it was so big I thought it might be wrong I was like this has to be ridiculous the p-value is, is zero I'm not even I'm not even playing with that this is zero I mean after five or six it's there's it's so small I mean you, you couldn't even see that on the David M. Lane applet so that's I like how happy this gets me as a nerd <laughs> Do the results cast doubt? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, since the null hypothesis is rejected. Yeah, we're, we're rejecting it. So the, that's tons of doubt on it. I mean, if you if you only observe 2% and they claim 86%, you would have so much doubt. You would say, I, I do not believe 86% anymore. Radioactive fallout. The questions just keep getting funner, more fun. <laughs> Speaking of, fallout comes out soon. From testing, atomic bonds drifted across the region. There were 224 people in the region at the time. 33 of them eventually died of cancer. Cancer experts estimate that one would expect only about 29 cancer deaths in a group that size. Assume the sample is a typical group of people. Ah, this is getting into weird ways of asking questions. So are the assumptions and conditions met? Random 10%, success, failure. Yep, we're met. And now going specifically... 29 out of that number, which is the sample size, 29 divided by 220 is the amount we would expect. So you notice this is P naught, the amount we would expect, the amount we hypothesize to be true. So is this death rate observed unusually high? Oh, wow, it says it right there. Is it unusually high? So is there evidence? that the true proportion of cancer deaths is greater than what we expect, our hypothesized proportion. So once again, we have P naught, we have X and N. X over N would be the, uh, make sure I keep the screen right here. Here's X, here's N, and P naught over here. So we can solve this all out by hand again. I mean, this is so redundant, and I feel like you guys will be experts in this. Um, you only have to get 80%, and I'm nearing on 80% now, I think, or I might have it. And I think the last few questions here are multiple choices. I added in some easier stuff. Even I want to get to the multiple choice. I'm like, where is that multiple choice? So there's P naught. It's what I hypothesized to be true. Here's my sample number of successes. Here's my uh, sample size. And then we asked if it's unusually high. So is the true proportion greater than? Very important to do that. And this time, let's go ahead and hit draw down here. So we're going to draw it out to see how it looks. And we'll find out, is it unusually high? That's not unusually high. Because I can automatically see the p-value there. My z-score is 0 0.798. And this is going to round. And then my p-value is 0.2124. And this would not be evidence. This p-value is low enough to include uh, the p-value is low enough to include the death rate. Wait, the p-value is too high. Uh, my brain just flipped there for a moment. The p-value is high enough to include the p-value is too high to conclude that the death rate is unusually high. So the p-value is higher than our 0.05 alpha that we generally use. So we do not have evidence. So that was not weird. Does this prove that the exposure to the radiation increased the risk of cancer? Um, no, there's insufficient evidence. We do not have enough evidence. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Should have read quicker. <laughs> so the, this one, they're getting a little bit more political, it seems. 
Um, oh, it's a prove. Oh, it's a, it's a prove. Well, yeah, you can't prove anything with statistics. That's very important. I didn't notice that prove word. That that they threw that in there to trick me. See what they do. See, uh, it's going on a roll. Just kind of brain in autopilot. So we can't prove it. it. Just there's not evidence, and that's the thing. When we retain the null, we we didn't prove the null to be true. We just we continue to believe the null, and that's why I say that in class. That prove word in there. Bad bad word. Which of the following hypothesis has the appropriate form for a null? Oh, so easy. Nice and easy questions. Getting close to that 73 80%. In a criminal jury, one option is to declare the defendant not guilty. In a hypothesis test, this is the equivalent to which one? It'd be failing to reject the null hypothesis, basically staying with it. We don't accept it as true, as that last question just did to me. I didn't prove that null to be true. I just continued to believe it. Tricky, tricky, tricky. The probability of seeing sample data like those seen or something even less likely given the null hypothesis is true is the p-value. Is the probability of our results or results more extreme happening due to random chance probability given, excuse me, the p-value is the probability of our results or results more extreme happening due to random chance variation given that the null is true. Which of the following hypothesis is not an appropriate form for an alternative? The alternative has less than greater than not equal to. It does not have that. Reject the null hypothesis if the p-value is below the level of alpha, meaning we need a small p-value. Smaller p-value, we reject the null when the p is low. Finally, which of the following alternative hypothesis is two-sided or two-tailed? And this is the one where we have to shade. Um, we'll just look at it real quick because we're almost done here. If we have a two-tailed alternative, we have to shade the outside like this. This would be a two-tailed, and let's look at them right here. We have our uh, greater than alternative, our less than alternative, and our two-tailed. And if you notice, the p-value here is 0.05. So if I go to the one-tailed greater than, it's half that, because I literally just took away half those half a tail, or one tail, so it has half its tails. And then the below, if this is 0.025, the less than alternative is 0.975. So the greater than and less than alternative, shading above or below a point, will give you 100% of the curve where the two-tailed alternative is double the smallest. You see how it goes from 2.5% to 5%. So that is our two-tailed alternative. And now we have made a 100. Good deal. As always, email me if you have questions.